those of you who experienced the latest mismatch between your hard-earned degrees and employers willing and eager to hire <coughs> will be, I hope, not chastened, but somewhat comforted by the brief tale I'm about to tell. Many of your elders, including two on this dais, will no doubt experience a strong and discomforting sense of deja vu. For American historians and their academic peers have lived through a number of similar mismatches from the last decades of the 19th century through the first decade just past. For the somewhat longer perspective, my hope is that we can distinguish transient from permanent crises, venial from mortal sins, and to realize that although many of us have been temporarily shunted onto sightings, the profession has been and with caring and sensible management, will continue to be on the right track. It's salutary to remember that before the Civil War, American graduate education of any sort did not exist, except perhaps in the best seminaries and divinity schools that required GA for admission. Small wonder that many college faculty were former, present, or future clergymen, and virtually all presidents were. But many educators were concerned that the nation's sprawling non-system of higher education did not reach high enough. It was, they feared, not keeping pace with the fast-moving century or meeting the rising standards of the learned world. American higher education was handicapped in the race by an insufficiently extensive and rigorous system of secondary education. Without better student preparation, the hundreds of small colleges and even nominal universities could not raise their standards for admission and graduation. Yet even had they been able to attract better students, college faculties were not ready to raise classroom standards and performance without curricular reform and much better preparation on their own parts. Forced by presidents and trustees to submit to prescribed foundational curricula, faculty had little need or encouragement to advance their own learning. Yoked to paternalistic institutional goals of piety maintenance and character building, they had even less opportunity or energy for it. As late as 1874, a Cornell professor was still <coughs> lamenting that the chief impediment for American professors was their regular assignment to what he called police duty and discipline in what amounted to reformatory schools. Most of them spent too much time in weary repetition of the rudiment and cudgeling the wits of refractory or listless reciters. Even had college teaching been more inviting, wannabe college professors had no institutional way to prepare for lifelong academic careers or for professional advancement by adding new knowledge to the emerging disciplines. A few colleges offered a handful of so-called postgraduate courses for those so attended, but they were regarded as necessarily imperfect aids taught by overworked and half-paid professors who are doing the duty of schoolmasters. The only wise course, said a frustrated Princetonian, was to flee the country and seek refuge in lands where such an aspiration was not considered absurd, by which he meant Germany. <laughs> Before World War I, some 9,000 Americans attended, at least briefly, one or more of the 20-some German universities to learn from some of the Western world's best scholars in a rich variety of arts, sciences, and professions. The attractions were numerous. The advent of steamships lowered the cost of travel. Living and learning in German university towns was relatively inexpensive. Students enjoyed unusual degrees of Lern and Lebenfreiheit, the freedom to choose their own university's professors and courses of study, and to make their own provisions for room and board. And the professoriate, all state employees, could teach what and how they wished. The biggest obstacle was the German language, which was not widely or well taught in American colleges. It was dauntingly complex, guttural, and often printed in difficult Gothic shrift. 
But with perseverance and careful avoidance of English-speaking cliques, it could be and was mastered enough to take advantage of advanced German learning, the standard by which the Western learned world measured itself. The academic and intellectual advantages of the German universities were numerous and well advertised by American returnees in books and articles and by word of mouth. The first advantage was specialization, the opportunity to dig deep in a subject and discipline. Related was an emphasis on original research and the creation of knowledge, primarily in well state funded scientific labs or advanced seminars where selected journeymen work closely with masters of the academic guild. <coughs> to prepare for advanced work, lectures by name authors framed important problems and featured the latest intellectual approaches to them. University and seminary libraries offered impressive collections of primary and secondary sources and runs of the leading journals, though not always ready or easy access. When the Americans' work broke new ground, however small, they were encouraged to publish it in the many journals that were being founded, thus providing them with the beginnings of professional stature and the impetus to make careers by contributing regularly to one's newly recognized discipline. The final fill-up to career building, of course, was the PhD, a degree largely unknown in America. After forays into the Teutonic land of the footnote, the American returnees might have been expected to import the German university wholesale to supply America's obvious needs, particularly at the graduate level. They did not do so because America was very different from, very much larger, less developed, more religious, and more democratic than Germany. America's biggest lack was a secondary school system that could rival that of the German gymnasium, the classical powerhouse that many Americans equated with the last two years of the American high school and the first two years of the typical American college. University admission was by gymnasium certificate. Virtually all gymnasium teachers were PhDs, and many were publishing scholars. Some easily taught university classes, or made a full transition to university teaching. America had nothing comparable, not even the elite New England prep schools. Rather than wholesale importation, American returnees and reformers resorted to cherry picking aspects of German higher education that made sense for native conditions and needs. Some things were easily transferred. The PhD, as the highest earned degree, was the most desirable. And even its rigorous multi-professor comprehensive exam and its relatively short specialized dissertations made the journey. American undergraduate classes were especially grateful for German style lectures as supplements to or replacements for regurgitative recitations devoted to classical gerund grinding and the basic math puzzles. Bigger and better equipped labs enabled science classes to progress from mere demonstrations of accepted truths to the discovery of new ones. Seminars for upper class and graduate students paved the way for more independent and more original work, as did the enlargement and improved accessibility of college and department libraries. The flowering of the curricular elective system following Harvard's early lead gave American students a liberating taste of German Lernfreiheit. And the adoption of Wissenschaft, the, American, or the German research ideal, similarly freed American faculty to pursue their intellectual passions, promoted specialization, and induced them to fashion CVs that emphasize scholarly publication as the coin of the new academic realm. Yet many features of the German university were left behind or revised to accommodate local conditions. America's private institutions rarely became state-funded or governed, as all German universities were, except in their robust extracurricular sideshows, as Woodrow Wilson called them. Freedom-seeking American undergraduates seldom escaped the Anglo-American collegiate ideal of carefully guarded residential life and faculty acting in loco parentis. 
The Germans' careful separation of church and state university found little favor on denominational American campuses wedded to daily chapel requirements. Until the founding of the AAUP in 1915, American faculty exercised true Lehrfreiheit, which abroad was protected by powerful state ministers of education, at the risk of alienating all powerful, publicly sensitive presidents and trustees. The American University developed numerous disciplinary departments rather than import Germany's large faculty or faculty system of academic organization, in which the philosophical faculty, for example, harbored all of what we regard as the liberal arts and sciences. And leaving behind mono and often autocratic heads of large disciplines, American departments were more democratically arranged. All faculty were salaried, eligible to teach graduate courses, and encouraged to pursue scholarship in their own chosen specialties. The unsalaried starting position of private docent, dependent on lecture fees and family wealth, did not migrate to America, nor did the second longer habilitation thesis required for admission to university teaching. The biggest revision of German practice was the development of the separate graduate school in America. In a German university, which did not distinguish graduate from undergraduate work, the PhD was the only degree. And only about 10 or 25 percent of German students bothered to take it. Yet the rest, known colloquially as Brotstudenten, bread students, prepared for state exams that provided entry to the other learned professions. In America's new graduate schools, the PhD became the highest postgraduate degree, and virtually everyone was expected to earn it, until the MA was transformed from a largely honorary degree to an earned one. Given the previous cost of undergraduate study, American grad students had in large part to be hired, as early critics accused with fellowships and other forms of financial aid. Among the eager, eager recruits were women who received the cold shoulder in most German universities. Unlike the curricular freedom of Germany, America's graduate schools felt compelled by growing enrollments, uneven student preparation, and watchdog agencies to institute formal courses, credits, exams, grades, and student classifications. They also did not initially require dissertations to be published for free exchange with other institutions. But at the turn of the century, later returnees and institutional pride persuaded the most ambitious universities to adopt the universal German requirement. In Germany, the printing was done by commercial publishers at the author's not in inconsiderable expense. Here, the work was published largely by the proliferation <coughs> Inspired university presses, often in monograph series rather than as independent books, and in learned journal series, which did emulate German venues. America had not waited for the establishment of fully fledged graduate schools to offer the first PhDs. Yale's Sheffield Scientific School, through a new department of philosophy and the arts, reminiscent of the German philosophical faculty awarded the first three earned doctorates. Yale's goal in large part was, they said, to retain in this country many young men, and especially students of science, who now resort to German universities for advantages of study no greater than we are able to afford. Penn followed in 1870 and Harvard three years later, by which time Yale had awarded 20 more degrees. By the time prominently Predominantly graduate Johns Hopkins and all graduate Clark and Catholic universities opened for business in 1876 and 1889, respectively. PhD production had become a growth industry. At the turn of the century, American graduate students in some 50 institutions numbered well over 5,600 and took home 342 PhDs and 1,744 MAs. Those attending European universities had fallen to fewer than 400 and kept sliding, particularly after the US and Germany locked arms in World War I. 